Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm the other guy. <laughs> and that's James, the other guy. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, this is the Industrial Design Podcast by us. By us. We don't have a tagline yet. By us. This is episode- For us. For you. <laughs> Isn't that a tagline of some company? By us. For us. Toys R Us? R.I.P. 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 Um, yeah, it's a, a podcast that we talk about design and uh, industrial design here in New York City, and um, yeah, we've been uh, we've been busy this past week. James has done some video work. Oh yeah, so now you can watch, listen to, enjoy the Minor Details podcast on YouTube. That's right. You can see our beautiful faces, oh. our glowing faces, and also yeah. I just noticed that the strap chair is in the background. Oh yeah. There's some product placement in product the Product placement. <laughs> um, we are sponsored by the strap chair. Free ratchet straps. We have so many <laughs> ratchet straps. Oh, man. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's, it's been really fun. I actually, I don't know if you know this about me, Nick, but I was actually a film major before I was an industrial design major. I did not know that. And uh, so it's been fun getting into the video editing mode. Okay. Um, and I've learned a lot of things. Uh, uh, well, actually, in this first thumbnail, I put the Minor Details logo on the bottom right of the thumbnail, not realizing that the uh, the length of the video marker <laughs> is right over top of it. It's a learning so process. It's a learning process. And that's what we love, you know? Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, our, our studio background is my bedroom. <laughs> But um, one day we'll one day we'll make it big time. Yeah, but I, but you know we can't forget our roots. Full t- we'll Nick. be full time podcasters one day. I would. Like we won't even. Fa- we won't even design. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll design live on YouTube. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, and also so be on the lookout. Not only are we going to be posting the podcast, but we're going to be posting them into clips. Um, so we'll have some micro details, little snippets, and then we'll, uh, I'll also upload the, uh, major details after the pod, the elusive major details. So you'll have the full, you know, experience, the full minor details experience. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll do some behind the scenes footage. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. We should start using that Instagram. We've been talking about it. Oh yeah. We did. There is actually an, inst- I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there's an Instagram for minor details. We haven't discussed it at all. Yeah. Well, I mean, at least post up the, the, the block, the tile, the tile for each episode. We could do that. I think that's, that's easy. And then we'll just, we'll just put a link in there to the, uh, to the episode mm-hmm. of like when, when each episode comes out, we'll put that in the, uh, the link section of the bio. Okay. Yeah. We you should, do, we should figure that out. We are, we're currently spitballing right here. This yeah. is, this is what brainstorming looks like. Right. Live on the pod. <laughs> Um, um, you also added some links or something, James. I know you were talking to me oh, about yeah. Amazon. Okay, so so here's a little here's a little pro tip. And what, I, what's you your know, pro tip? I was talking to Seth Fowler about you know starting the YouTube and everything. Right. And we had him on the podcast. We had him on too. the podcast. If you miss that episode, go back and listen to it. It's good. It is a great podcast. Um, and uh, so uh, what a lot of YouTubers do because because ad revenue isn't what it used to be. Uh, there's a whole thing that happened on YouTube called the Adpocalypse. What was that? Where it's very difficult to get um, ads onto your onto your um, videos if oh, like okay. if they uh, I don't know if there's any sort of like strike against the the video itself. I like see. there's I any see. content that could be controversial right. at all. Okay. So uh, a lot of like, YouTubers. So for example, when I 3D print my guns. <laughs> can i put an ad on that video or no no okay. i don't think so okay um but uh but i will i will sponsor them and and i think fat strap chair will sponsor those videos thanks fat strap. yeah uh but um but yeah so a lot of a lot of the original youtube creators who are like comedic in nature they kind of came out against this this whole adpocalypse because like they're, they're doing they're always, comedy, but they're doing satire. They're always and, doing controversial topics. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So, um, so anyway, uh, because ad revenue is uh, not as consistent as it once was, uh, a lot of YouTubers are using things like Amazon Associates. Okay. So what Amazon Associates is is 
in the links of their videos, they'll put a link to like, here's the equipment that I use. Oh, like the camera they use and the yeah. mic. Yeah. Okay. And so they actually, if you click on that link and you buy that, you know, whatever it is through that link, they actually get a percentage of that right. sale. Okay. And it's not a, a like crazy amount of money. It's like royalty money. It's yeah. like, you know, two Dollars. or three percent, whatever. Right. Um, but I was thinking about this today, Nick, and, you know, as designers, when we work for corporations and really work for anybody, a lot of the time we are paid for our work and then that's where the money stops. Right. You know, we don't necessarily get royalties nope. unless we're licensing our work. Right. And so I saw this as like, oh my gosh, like so often are we promoting the work that we've done on our Instagrams or anywhere? And this is really a pro tip for anybody. You can set up an Amazon Associates account and you can link to your product and essentially get get some sort of compensation for advertising for your work. That's so true because I've... I've put up all my pet products yeah. on my Instagram and been like, hey, guys, go buy these. Yeah. And we, yeah, I could, I could have like had a little like royalty cut off of that. Yeah. I mean, it, it only, I, I feel like it only makes sense. We're getting. Now, we're, granted, I don't think it would be like a payday. I think, no, I don't think it would be a payday either. <laughs> I think you're probably only going to make like 10 bucks a year, but <laughs> hey, <laughs> it's a thought that counts, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's this weird thing because I don't know that Amazon was necessarily thinking about this when they started this program. I think that they were thinking, you know, people who have, I don't know, like I feel like it's like links for websites and mm. people that have a further reach. Hey, is there lifestyle people? Oh, like blogs and things. Yeah. Is there a way that you can add in a link to Amazon where it's like, hey, I'm going to shop and I'm, and I'm going to shop through minor details? Like mm. can, can someone buy anything on Amazon? Using our link, I think. I think that I think they can. I think it's if so, we need to cha- we didn't make a minor details Amazon link, and then you guys can set it as your homepage, and then we'd be set, right? <laughs> we'll figure that set out. for life. But we're 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 working through this uh, YouTube uh, thing. We're trying to expand. Yeah, uh, you know, obviously we want we want to up the quality of the podcast. Always and, be improving and get out of this get out of this dank bedroom. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that that's like kind of a tip for anybody because there's some, there are some people that put up their work and I'm kind of like, oh, like I actually now feel a deeper connection to that work Mm -hmm. because I know that designer and I know them to do good work. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think there's something interesting about that. I think with things like that and things like Kickstarter, we're getting closer and closer to the creator's of the products that we're using. And it's almost like we're traveling back in time to that point in point in time where you would in your town, you yeah. would go to the person the blacksmith. that did that, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. The shoemaker. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. It's, hmm. As the world, That's a cool as, yeah, the world is getting actually kind of smaller it in is. a way. Um, but yeah, that's, that's awesome. Thank you, James, for doing all this. Uh, I appreciate it. I've just been maxed out on my uh, podcast level. You know, I gotta like, I gotta, I gotta like, stitch it all together. And I don't... <laughs> listen, I'm not asking you to do anything, Nick. No, no, it's good. Just let me do it. <laughs> um, but definitely check that out on YouTube, guys, if you haven't yeah. seen it. Um, also, we went to the Noguchi Museum last Oof. week. That was fun. Yeah, we needed we needed a museum trip. We needed some some inspiration in our blood. Inspo. Yeah, and uh, where else could you go? I mean, I um I went to the Noguchi Museum a couple of years ago for the first time, and I just remember it being this really profound experience for me. It's very serene. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's uh, uh Noguchi. I mean, just to explain it for right, those who don't right. know, he. He, he was a Japanese designer. Is that correct? Uh, Japanese, I guess, sculptor would be okay. Would be his main. He, he started out as an like a fine artist. Correct? Yeah, he started out as a sculptor, I believe. Oh, we got, we're gonna have to double check. We're, we'll have to double check that. <laughs> um, but uh, he does these just beautiful uh, round bulbous forms, and he also does these lamps. Um, he did the famous coffee table that kind of looks like 
two L shapes and the glass thing on top. Yeah, I think I'm actually... I'm sure if you've seen it. It's the table um, on the set of the Conan O'Brien Tonight Show. Okay. Yeah. So if you've seen Conan, you've seen the table. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we went there, got some inspiration. It was beautiful. Yeah. The first room is kind of... It, the. It's really crazy because it's these sculptures that are seemingly raw and then they'll have very geometric sort of intrusions mm. into them almost like extrude cuts right it's like a giant stone block yeah and then there's like a, a perfect sphere in the center yeah it's amazing and and, you and there's just, it's not cnc it's all no, done by hand it's that is the most amazing part about it because you walk by you see some of the sculptures and you're like i'm thinking in my head how i would achieve that in cad <laughs> And I'm like, oh, it's just like, you know, you take a you take a square, you rotate the other square on a on a separate plane and you just loft in between right. them. Easy. But this guy is just chiseling away and grinding away and it's it's really a lot of his sculptures feel like to me, they feel like blown up details, product details. You know, like you you solve some right. volcanoes. That, oh, I love that volcano. That volcano. Volcano shape classic. There's just some of them, yeah, they feel like if you took a detail of a product and and blew it up mm -hmm. to, you know, the size of a table. Right. Um, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Very gorgeous great. work. Highly recommend checking out that museum. For sure. Check it out. Um, we have some design news, James. Oh, we have design news? Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> well, <laughs> it. I mean, I'm sure you've heard. We just wanted to touch on it. But Apple was the first U.S. company to ever hit a trillion dollars. A uh, trillion dollar Ooh. worth. Okay, James. <laughs> James, you're hating on Apple, man. You got to give them some credit here. Oh, right? no. No, no, no. Well, I mean, I could have seen that there was a sales strategy to get to a trillion dollars the way that they were doing things. Oh, you mean... In recent years. After Steve left. After Steve. And they started making 10 iPhones each year. Yeah. I mean, that is like a pure sales strategy it is it is but um i mean the foundation that it's built on is pure and great and grand but the way that they got there is i, I don't know i i don't want to sound like this purist and i don't want to sound like i am like against companies being successful right and like i don't want to be that guy that's like oh i liked them when they were you know indie <laughs> Like, I don't, you know, a bunch of sellouts. I like Steve Waz. <laughs> but uh, I just feel like, you know, Hector and I never really got a chance to have the full debate. And I and I really want that full debate because I feel like they've they've lost touch with the vision. I OK, I I can agree with somewhat of that. I think, yes, they might have lost a little bit of that Steve touch and some of that magical moment of just being simple and having one iPhone, one laptop, one iPad, whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um, but I also think that they are still top of line quality. I, oh, yeah. You know, like there is not really a competitor yet. I mean, obviously there's, you know, Google and Microsoft and, you know, Amazon are curtailing up there. But um, I, I don't know. I think Apple still has really amazing products. And I wanted to say a little another little update that i did this past week which is kind of crazy i have so i have a desktop pc i don't have a macbook well actually right. i do have a old macbook yeah it's I, well, 10 years old and we thing i'm recording on we, right now we still record on my old 10 year old macbook yeah um but my desktop pc has solidworks and all the design programs which is great but unfortunately i can't travel with it so i've right. been trying to like think about how i can figure out this problem and I was like, I have an iPad, and there's got to be a way to access my desktop PC from my iPad. So I, <laughs> so I did a lot of Googling, and guess what? I figured out a remote desktop application called Jump Desktop. And uh -huh. I downloaded it, and then I also bought this mouse that works specifically with that app. You can only buy this specific mouse. There's only, like, one. Okay. Um, so I bought the mouse. And of course, I have a Bluetooth keyboard, and now I can access my desktop PC anywhere in the world just with my iPad, which is crazy. And it's it's really fast. I mean, it's not it is over the internet, so it's not perfect. You know, there is some lag, but mm -hmm. very little, like not enough to 
impede my workflow. Yeah. So it, I can ac- I can model on SolidWorks on my iPad, which is kind of crazy. That that is pretty crazy. But oh, it, also, it f- I just I do want to shout out the mouse because I'm sure after we after we release this pod, people are going to ask me what the mouse is. It's called the Citrix X One. But is, do your research because could, could can you buy it on Amazon? Uh, you, I don't know. I think I had to buy it on their site because there's really? they they don't actually sell it. They they don't sell it out because it's like an enterprise version or something. It's very specific because they don't. Apple doesn't have a mouse com- mouse for the iPad, so you have to go through an external app like this Jump Desktop. But take a look, research it. I'm sure we can get some sort of Amazon affiliate thing. On it, yeah, but, maybe. Um, isn't that isn't that interesting though that there's still utility for the mouse, even though I feel like maybe the the language around I don't know that anybody ever called the iPad a mouse killer, but it it feels like you know. I'll tell you what a mouse killer is. What's the? <laughs> no, no, not. Oh, no. I mean a mouse trap. I guess no. What I mean is VR. Right. That's gonna kill the mouse for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or the product we're working on. Shh. It's online. You can check it out. <laughs> but um. So, uh, so yeah, that's what uh, that's what a uh, fun little fun fact I did with Apple. That's pretty iPad awesome. Recently, that's pretty amazing. I mean, I I feel like you know in my experimentation with with a program like like on shape, you know, which I continue to use. Right. I, I feel like browser based things that can run on like a light machine. That's, that's the future. That is the future. Cloud based browser based. Yeah. Um, I mean, Google docs, Google, Sli- I, all of that stuff. Yeah. It's all going to the cloud. I've been, I've been doing all the graphics for the, uh, for the YouTube, um, for the YouTube, uh, with Google Slides, I haven't been doing it in in, in design. Oh wow, okay. Because I'm like, I just just like, easier. It's just easier, and the idea that like everything's saved as you go, right? It's perfect. I did try on shape. I will mention that. Okay. Um. Yeah, James got me to try on shape. <laughs> it was good. No, at I, gunpoint I, using I, his own <laughs> 3D printed guns. <laughs> um. I enjoyed it. I really like the workflow of it. I think the workflow and how everything is saved to the cloud, kind of like we were saying, it's it's Google Docs, but SolidWorks. Right. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I think just at this point, it's it's not a mandatory thing that I need to switch over yet. Right. But I think once I once it is, like SolidWorks phases out or whatever happens, I'll switch over eventually. Right. Yeah. And I think that there there's some features that are missing but they are working yeah they're it's, a young company for sure. they're working actively it to, takes time uh, it takes time to that but that. i actually modeled so i i did a noguchi inspired car i love it i saw it thank you and i actually sketched it out in front of you i was like nick i have an idea yeah. right after the museum that's how inspiring that trip was uh but i i modeled that in on shape and uh paul sohi I believe that's his name. You remember him from mm-hmm. uh, right? He he challenged me to a race because he just modeled a car, <laughs> and uh, so he's so we're doing two races. Are you going to print yours out and race them? He's going to take mine and put it onto uh, like the body of a of a like a race car thing. Oh, are they RC or what? I think they're RC. Whoa! And, but then also, I think Derek Elliott is going to do an animation. Of okay. a race okay. with our cars. And who's going to win? Well, I think we're going to have to do a poll okay. on Derek's on Derek's uh, Instagram see. to see, see who wins. Okay. Uh, so that was that was kind of fun. Uh, Paul was uh, he printed out his and he was he was kind of uh, egging me on. I flaunting, guess. flaunting, yeah, flaunting it on his stories. Nice. Um, but yeah, the, the race is on. Okay, I look forward to that then. Yes, you will. <laughs> um. So yeah, congrats to Apple, James. I don't know what you. Want, oh James. gosh, <laughs> restraint, restraint, Apple. Please. I also, I also own a lot of Apple stock, so I'm happy. Um, but anyways, uh, maybe that's why I'm so on that. <laughs> we also had another kind of design news, and we kind of wanted to dive into the topic of this. But um, there is a YouTuber. We're talking a lot about YouTube this episode, yeah. but his name is Jacob Dawson. He runs this YouTube channel called Myron, mm-hmm. and he. He is a design student or was a design student in New Zealand. Yeah. And he also 
just posts a lot of his industrial design process and kind of his stories of being a student. He's an on industrial YouTube. design vlogger. Yeah, and that's a much better way he to is, say it. He is. Uh, I don't want to say the Jake Paul of ID. <laughs> he's not, for sure not. Uh, but uh, yeah, he's a character. We all know that's... Uh... It, the thing that's so funny about him to me is like, um, in a lot of American vlogs, you'll see... It, it's so obvious to me that he's from New Zealand and he's very courteous. Okay. Because like, he lives in an apartment with roommates. Right. But And so all of his vlogs are very like, you know, the normal American vlog is like, hey guys, how's it going? This is me, Jake Paul. <laughs> like, you know, it's very, it's very loud and very energetic. Right. And his are like, hey everybody, it's Mary. Like he's like kind of, he's whisper shouting because he's so kind to his roommates. He doesn't want to cause a lot of ruckus. He, he is definitely a very charismatic, but interesting fellow yeah we've never talked to him no i've never even followed him or anything i just occasionally see his videos yeah on youtube but i one video caught my eye this past week and he said that he is quitting design school yeah which is you know sure plenty of people quit design school but i think the significance of what of this is that he's this vlogger and he's gonna well one he's gonna document his journey quitting design school and um two like what we get to see his pro, I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe there was only, two, maybe there was only one reason. But well, I think the, I think the big thing here is is that he determined that he could actually after his internship with this um, what what he called an internship. I, I love what did I he love call just it? an internship. An internship. Uh, yeah, the first time that I was aware of him was his his um collaboration with uh Sketchfresh. Okay. Um, another Jacob. Right. Uh, and uh. He taught him what what uh, what Jacob Mirren said was ideation sketches. <laughs> I, uh, ideation, I, yes. I but. love I love just like the little tweaks. You know, we're what? all speaking English what? here. Why is it that like what do English do the British people say idea? Idea. I, I think because I feel like occasionally I hear people with the R on the end of idea. Yeah, I know. And you hear it in the South a lot. I got a good idea. <laughs> Well, but you actually, also hear it in like England. Well, you know? don't you know uh, the southern accent is actually a derivative of the Scottish accent. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I can see it. Um, so that's where that's where a lot of, or like even the Cockney accent is mm -hmm. a little bit. You can find like parallels in there. I mean, I can do a good southern accent. You know, I'm I'm from North Carolina, born and raised. <laughs> um, oh gosh, but viewership just went down. It's uh, <laughs> I you you guys can. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, um, I went to school in the South. I consider it the South. Virginia Tech. Yeah, Virginia Tech. Um, but um, but well, anyway. I, so. wanted, I wanted to say about uh, Myron, his idea is that, like you were saying, he did this internship. He did a video collaboration with Sketchfresh. Like he just Skyped him in and uh, Sketchfresh taught him how to sketch. And his idea, Myron's like, I'm quitting design school because what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just keep doing these collaborations with other designers and right. learn from them and also post it to YouTube. So in the sense he is, he's in, he's in a way like taking knowledge from other designers, learning, but also teaching at the same time. Yeah. Which is really interesting, which is a really interesting thing that I don't know. I don't think anyone's ever really done it. No. Um, and then he also, he also, I, the next video he went on to say, He's going to start his own design studio, which is a whole nother level. But right, right. The first step was interesting for sure. Yeah, well, because he's, I think he's trying to figure out how to fund the whole venture, and part of that is through Patreon. But he needs a decent amount of patrons in order to sustain right this. But he's up to ten thousand subscribers on YouTube, which is like, I mean, for an Instagram or a industrial Instagram, design. industrial design. YouTube, like that's pretty impressive. It's a very niche community. That's yeah. a, a lot for YouTube. So, um, yeah, I think it's really, I think it's interesting because I've been thinking a lot about this as we've had, you know, continue this relationship with somebody like Chris Ferentz, mm -hmm. who's kind of learning through the community. I mean, it does start to like beg this question of what, what then is the purpose of design school? Right. I think, I mean, I can come up for with reasons for design school, and I think that somebody like 
uh, Jacob Dawson, Mirren, he's a unique example of somebody that that can go out there and do this sort of thing. And maybe this is the best way for him to learn. Mm. And I think there's, I think there's obviously different uh, ways that people, you know, can learn how they learn best is different from person to person. Yeah. And I think that design school allows you this bubble for development, you know, allows you this time to experiment and to develop your, your, for sure. You know, you, who you are and your process. And uh, although that continues throughout your career. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. It's like, you know, in this day and age with the internet and everything, we do have access to all the all the hard skills for sure. Like you, right. can, le- you can learn sketching, key shots. All, you can learn all the technical skills you want of industrial design. Um, but, you know, I, me, me personally, I think that there is some sort of intangible element that you get in design school. And maybe that is just because you're in this collaborative environment. Right. Um, you're able to work in the studio together and make things and understand form at another level than you could maybe on your own. Right. Um, but you know, maybe there's an, there's an alternative to that. I mean, I, you kind of touched on it last episode of, um, apprenticeships. Mm-hmm. Cause, cause you said to something to the fact of like, why don't we have apprenticeships anymore? Like where instead of going to college, you just go learn from a doctor or yeah. a lawyer or whatever it is. Like you just right. learn the practice and then eventually work full time. Yeah. I think, I think the most interesting thing about this, this whole experiment in this day and age is the fact that so many kids are going to, des- going to school in general and accruing large amounts of debt mm. in order to do so. And, it's, and the art school is not cheap. No, it's, it's not expensive. Che- it's not cheap. I mean, uh, I would say that Virginia Tech was definitely like on the more affordable end mm-hmm. of, of the schools. SCAD was mid level. It's not like it's not like an art center or a Pratt, but it was right. in between those two. Right. But I mean, to have some sort of viable alternative to to this thing where you know school is considered this like well obviously you're going to college and i feel like more and more we're going to see these alternative paths mm-hmm. you know somebody like mirin like doing this on his own and then sort of creating almost an online university i mean the tutorials have been out there the hard skills right. have been out there um but yeah, I think design school, what design school does offer is this opportunity for you to be amongst peers. Mm. I think, you the, know... There's a lot of value in that, for sure. I think, I, yeah. it, for one, it pushes you. Right. Like, you can really compete and push yourself. Right. Compete in a, a good way. I know, like, there's competition, and sometimes it could be negative, but, you know, always make that competition positive, right? Always keep on building each other up and pushing each other to be better Yeah. as a community. Um, and then, yeah, we were kind of saying like the, the whole aspect of like being able to like collaborate and learn those right. soft skills that you don't learn right online. Right. But like the, the apprenticeship back to the apprenticeship point. I mean, I know that, I know that in, I think in Germany, they actually decide very early on whether like uh, a kid is going to like go on to college or like, it's like very regimented. I learned German in school. And so like, this was a part of the curriculum was like knowing about the German school system. That's interesting. But they, they had built into their school system apprenticeship. Like instead of going to university, you would go into an apprenticeship. And if like, it was like Harry Potter, the wizard hat, like you are now sorting apprenticeship (laughs) and everyone's like, Oh Yeah. The sorting hat. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so that is very built into their culture. And I just wonder, like, what if you did take someone like like Mirren or like Chris Ferentz and you just, like, you know, instead of you having Chris Ferentz for a week, you had him for, you know, an entire year. Oh. Like, how? what would... <laughs> oh, no. I'm just kidding, Chris. What would that, like... Where would his skill level be at the end of that year? Here's here's an interesting thing. I always think it's funny when you do an internship or a um, apprenticeship, how you're 
in school, you're so malleable, right? You are so, I feel like I'm the designer I am because of like the internships and the projects I did in school. Right. You know, if I decided to do like a Dieter Rams inspired project, I would be a lot more Dieter. Like my very first industrial design project was taking the philosophy of not to Fukusawa. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I kind of embodied that philosophy. And now that's, that's me. Like I, yeah. I make projects that go towards that. Yeah. And then I also think about like the internships I did. I had an internship with, um, a guy named Todd St. John and he built this studio called Hunter Gatherer. And I feel like I, I take a lot of inspiration from his work too. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting how those, those influences really, really can change how you design later on in life. Right. When you're in school and when you're in that learning process. Right. And we've talked about it in prior podcasts about Cincinnati and the co-op system. Mm, right. And, um, cause they do, they do a, internship every other yeah every other quarter or every other semester right it's like a semester yeah and then internship semester internship kind and of i've heard i i've kind of heard like the pluses and and minuses of that but i wonder if there is some sort of in between like like there's the there's this like the well i mean obviously there's the standard go to design school right do the do the thing do it for four years and then get out or there's now this approach of learn it all online like you know through through something like right. this um I, I will this is a proposal i do want to interject i do want to say one thing on the online thing uh-huh i think it is still in this day and age right now i think it's still a lot harder to do the online route and actually become successful. Right. Not saying it's impossible, but I think if you're thinking about this right now, I think going to design school, four-year degree, yeah. doing a few internships, graduating, you can get a job much easier that way yeah. than just sitting, like graduating high school and then learning online. I think it takes a certain type of person. For sure. But but yeah, the two things. Hear school, me out. <laughs> sorry. So so here's, here's another alternative. Okay, the third alternative. So I am... Um, I mean, I took a year off before I even went to college. Like oh. that was something that I built into. I did not know that. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and and funny enough, went to New Zealand um, during that time. But I'm wondering if what if what if you were to do something like okay, so for instance, Stefan Sagmeister, mm-hmm. he um, famous graphic designer. Yes, notorious for this this scheme that he that he decided on, which was every five years he would take a year off to do whatever. He would shut sabbatical. down his studio. Right. He would go on sabbatical. Okay. What if school was actually even like more extended, or just like? Oh, that's it. so you would take a year, learn all like these initial intro skills yeah then work in the industry for a year yeah and then come back and do like almost like a thesis project i yeah. imagine and I then mean, keep doing that until maybe you've done like two or three thesis projects and then you can go work for, that's interesting yeah like really mixing it into just, more long-term things yeah just really extending it because i i felt when i decided to take the year off i had felt like everything up until that point all of school had been so condensed and that to me felt overwhelming. And I was like, why do I, why do I want to rush off to college to just put myself back into the same position of just like, like the, the school grind. Right. And I, I just, you know, this was like something that was encouraged by my parents to like take a year off. And like, that's interesting. I did. I did a lot of things. Did your parents do that or no? No. But why, it's, why it's they... something that's very common in other cultures. Huh. I, like, I've never... I've, I was born going to school. <laughs> <laughs> born working. I've never taken a year off or any... Yeah. Well, I mean, I've taken summers off for school. But, but it was... Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, like, I just didn't feel the desire to go straight to college. And like in, in England, and I think in like probably New Zealand and Australia, like taking a gap year is like very common. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's what I, that's what I did. It gave me a ton of perspective and I remember coming to school my first year and, and like feeling like there were a lot of students around me that could have used some of that perspective. Mm. I think in that year you mature a lot, I think is kind of what 
what happens. Yeah, so I, I'm just wondering, like, if there isn't some sort of alternative to the condensed four-year school. Yeah. Um, I mean, for sure, I think there could be. Or, the, or at least a third alternative. I mean, honestly, too, in this day and age with technology and you know, the entire internet movement, I, there will be a time when I don't know what school will be anymore. Will it be some sort of mixture of all these things or will it, it will all be in vr yeah. who knows you know yeah well and it's also like we're getting we're living to older and older ages so like the amount of time that we have on earth is just exponentially getting larger eventually we'll be 300 years old or something yeah. right so why rush through school <laughs> um i do here's another one one quick note have okay. you had any friends that went to school Went only for like two or three years, Mm -hmm. got an internship, but they were so good that they just decided to keep working and eventually got a full-time job. Uh, Do you know anyone like that or no? No, I don't. Because I have a couple of people I know. Couple? Yeah, that that went to school, went to SCAD, then left like junior year to do an internship, and they did another internship, and then eventually like after two internships, they just got hired full-time, never finished their degree. Yeah. Uh, my good friend Leighton McDonald, I think, went to work at Donda with Kanye West to do like the. Uh, Whoa! The, Wait uh, a minute. What? Oh, I got lots of friends connected with Kanye. You didn't know that? Why? Why is this just now coming up? Well, because it's uh, I've signed multiple NDAs. <laughs> well, and and <laughs> apparently you shredded them right before the podcast. <laughs> no, um, but yeah, I actually do have a friend that that works for Yay right now. Why do I not have Yeezy 500s on my feet? Well, because those are old. He's just started. He'll get he'll get <laughs> you a new pair. He'll get you a new pair, James. Fine. Um, but yeah, I I uh I think that's also a viable route. Like if you get an internship, there I I think it's a a thing that you can at a certain skill level you can get a full time job. Yeah. Job. Well, and I and I have to, and I also have to say something about something that my one of my professors said. And and I think we should also say that like I a lot of the professors that I had had a profound effect on me. Right. And so like I don't want to downplay the idea of going to design school because of how many amazing professors that mm. I had that shaped, Very true. Very that true. shaped the way that I think about things. I did as well. Mm-hmm. Because I think that there's, you know, one size does not fit all. Mm-hmm. You know, they're all like, but I think that there should be viable alternatives to going to school. Yeah, I think the optimum is some sort of mixture. Yeah, right? like you were saying. But but what I was going to say is one of my professors uh, at Dorsa. I remember him saying this. He was like, "Listen, grades don't matter in design. Like for sure, do not matter. And like, so it's it's all about your portfolio. Like, if I give you this grade on this project and you show it to somebody and they love it, like who cares what the grade was? Right. I mean, that was such a liberating moment for me. I think that was in third year. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like I should just focus on the work and the grades will come. It, like that is such key. That's such a key thing to understand. And yeah. people don't talk about it enough. No, I, none of my, I remember in school, like none of my friends really understood that. Yeah. I understood. It. I was like, I'm making my portfolio to get a job like that's right. the whole reason i'm here i'm not right. here for the piece of paper or like yeah. the a's like no i'm getting my portfolio ready right and i think that that's just a problem in general with like the school system at least coming up until college because you are so focused on the grade oh like I, yeah that's a whole nother that's like, a whole other topic <laughs> but but i um but yeah i mean it was such a liberating moment and it's like yeah of course you could leave school get a job like if you have a great portfolio or you have a job like what's the point in a diploma? Nobody else in your design career is ever going to be like, before we hire you, we're going to need to see that. And if they do that see that, then you, then you can just walk out. <laughs> then you can just walk out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I hope I hope that there was some insights there. We don't really have any, in, I don't know. It was just like our thoughts on that. I think it's a really... Just inter- a discussion. Yeah? I think it's a really interesting thing that, that Jacob is doing. Right. And I would love to... I think we should reach out to him and try to get like have a conversation with him for sure. Because, I mean, if he ever comes to New York, we'll need it. Yeah, get him in here and yeah, talk to him about it. Um, maybe we could teach him a thing or two. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, but anyway, yeah, I uh, I think it's just fascinating, and uh, we'll see where it goes. But yeah, so if you follow 
Mirren on uh, YouTube. on YouTube, you'll see his journey yeah. as it unfolds. For sure. Um, and we also like to answer questions on our oh, podcast. Oh, yeah, we love it. And this week we got a, a good few questions coming in here. Um, our first question comes from Cooper, and he just had an internship at a package design uh, firm. Cool. And he said he really enjoyed it. He's a he's an industrial designer. He's studying industrial design, but um, his question is: If I continue to pursue package design, I'm afraid I might pigeonhole myself and not be able to work as a traditional designer. What do you guys think about this? And his he kind of second part is like: If he wants to pursue package design, do should he focus now on his all of his school projects on package design? Mm. Yeah, I. Oof. I mean. I remember seeing somebody, uh, uh, a graduate, a graduate of Virginia Tech, come back and give a presentation. Um, he happened to fall in love with boat design, marine design, yeah. Yeah, and he uh, he got in touch with the company um, early on, I think, and uh, he decided he basically decided like this is exactly what I want to do. Yeah, and he then made every single project afterward about boat design i think yeah i think you can focus on one area of design if you are like dead set on that like if that is like something that you've been wanting to do since day one then i say go all for it but if you're you kind of like discover this new thing and you really enjoy it i think maybe be a little more cautious i mean i remember like going to school like really enjoying car design and like really wanting to get in automotive but i'm clearly not there anymore i wouldn't (laughs) definitely not want to do that i mean I would just for the experience, but uh, not as a full time forever. Um, I would also say another thing is that I think you're only pigeonholed by yourself. Right. Like, I don't think you can actually pigeonhole your career. I think as long as you are passionate enough, you can always get out of that and design something else. Yeah. I mean, for example, like I've been doing pet products for three years now, going on four years. Like, that's a lot of pet products. And I have like picked up a lot more pet work like it's it is starting to make a pigeonhole for me but i also know that i can break out of that anytime right and do other projects because i have established myself as right a much broader designer right yeah i i was definitely worried i got into you know the kitchen tools and gadgets game Mm -hmm. and i was there for three years and i i was fearful of of the pigeonhole effect right and um but we're not- i, I kind of made a conscious decision I, I like i i need to break out of this i need to do work that's outside of this so that i don't end up in this field not that it's a bad field but i was i was interested in tackling other types of problems but i think yeah it doesn't hurt to like buffer your portfolio with industrial design work like you know just traditional industrial design work if that's something that you are still somewhat interested in. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that if you were to do packaging design right now, that it would completely negate any sort of attempt to escape the packaging design industry should you find it later on down the road to not be of interest anymore. Right. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I mean, I also, one thing in school that I also enjoyed was furniture. Mm-hmm. And we had a full furniture design major at SCAD. And I could have been... I could have had a degree in furniture design and been like 100% furniture design. But I decided that I do love furniture, but I also love other design. And I wanted to still keep that broad skill set and look. <laughs> the fast strap chair, James, James is pointing <laughs> to it. Um, but yeah, you can always do side projects on your own time to expand that thing. I mean, if you look at my portfolio, there's only like two prep products or something like that. Right. And a bunch of other like miscellaneous stuff. So Yeah. Also, we need passionate packaging designers out there yeah it's a it's definitely something that not a lot of people are passionate about so congrats to you cooper i'm super pumped that you enjoy it so um yeah thanks for sending that in cooper great question uh we also have another question did you want to read it james i'm gonna i'm gonna see how good these uh new glasses are for me uh the uh the person who's asking the question is nirawit yep nirawit um, and they ask, what is something you do to make sure that you're always improving as a designer? That's a good question. Yeah. Hmm. Nick? I'm always viewing other designers. I'm always 
leveling myself with other designers. <laughs> He's got a he's got a pair of binoculars. No, gosh, I got him out. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah, I'm always comparing myself to other designers. I think you have to be a certain you have to have a certain mindset to do that. I think comparing yourself to other designers can be a dangerous game if you aren't um, careful. Right. But but I I enjoy the competition. I enjoy looking at other people and be like, dang, they do great work, and I'm gonna push myself to be better than them. Hmm. and that's me not everyone's like that but that is one that's one way i'm always improving as a designer how i how can i take you know the skill set that this designer really excels at and try to take some of that knowledge and implement into Hmm. mine Hmm. designs that's interesting so the way that the way that i typically go about it is is actually when i see somebody mastering a certain skill yeah i just turn the other direction you you break down and cry (laughs) i do all the time uh, you should see my apartment full no. of Kleenex. Uh, I uh, no, I always pivot. I always like. I always try to go the other direction of where I see the herd moving. And, okay, well, it's a little okay. I and, think yes, and I understand I, that too. But yeah, that that's a little bit of a diversion from my comment. Yeah, I'm, well, no, it's not. <laughs> yes, it is, Jay. <laughs> you're talking about being slightly competitive and like wanting to do stuff. But you're. But are, are you saying that you're taking bits of the of that person's I, skill and incorporating it into your work? Yeah, it's not like I'm following a herd. Right. I think the herd thing is what. No, I'm not saying you're a sheep. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, not saying you're sheep. I'm not putting. I don't know what, what's a like trendy thing nowadays. Oh, I don't know uh, what sexy renders. I don't oh, know render porn. Yeah, I'm not. Well, I mean, I do like that, but. Yeah, you've got some render porn. Okay, continue, your, continue, <laughs> continue your thing. Continue. Your thing. No, I no. I, so you, you don't. You turn that away. You don't over. You don't oversaturate with renders. Right. You don't. You, yeah. Um, no, but what I'm saying is, is that I have this tendency of like, I don't even want to attempt to do what that person's doing. I want to just like do what, like do something different. I just want to do, I just want to do my own thing. And, and oftentimes I think that's to my detriment actually. Um, because I'm like, I I feel like I do kind of get intimidated by, by certain skills. And I'm like, but like, I, I just end up trying to develop something different. That's, that's a good strategy too. I don't think, I don't think it's a detriment, but I, I think that there is, there is a chance in that strategy to really break out and do like for me here's an example yeah when i first saw vr right my, my my friend Leighton mcdonald was the one that showed it to me and i was like whoa this is something new that no one is doing this is something that for your strategy you could turn away and go do it right and build it out and yeah s- and i think i've really built out that that yeah, skill set yeah. and it's really you know, i don't know it's i feel like I'm pretty known for that. Yeah. No, you're a pioneer. Right. And I'm not saying when when I'm saying this, I'm not saying that you are somebody who's, who's like leading the herd. I think that you are a unique voice in the Instagram community. And, and like, so when I see you doing that, I'm like, well, I'm not going to do VR sketching. Like I would incorporate that into like my workflow otherwise, Mm. but I wouldn't necessarily be like, you know what? I'm going to make that my thing too. That. And that is a key difference in this topic, I think, is that, one, we're talking about how do you differentiate yourself as a designer on Instagram and as your personal brand. Right. And then the other is, like, how do you prove your actual workflow yeah. as a designer? So I would say So that, I, I was speaking to the, my workflow. Like, right. how can I take these bits and pieces and, like, go and work for a client and make their product great? Right, right, right. You're that, saying, like, how do I build my own personal brand as a designer? Yeah. Okay. So in terms of, like improving myself as a designer i'm far more interested right now in developing my personal philosophy Mm. because i want to be more consistent in terms of like how i approach a project how i think about a project how i extrapolate like what like the big idea is right and i i'm i've been very just totally fascinated with um stefano giovanoni who's like the top selling designer for Alessi like over and over. Right. And I'm just, because his work, I was listening to um, a lecture that he gave today or just like a, like a video, Ted, Ted like video right? where he was just talking about like, Oh, I didn't really design much. I just like, like, this is the idea. Like this is the, the manifestation of my philosophy. Right. And so, 
you know, I feel like there are times where we break through and like, for instance, when you thought of the the birdhouse for your MakerBot project, like that was just like came fully formed because it was it was the 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 essence of a philosophy that you are developing for yourself. Yeah. And so for me, what I'm trying to do as well is trying to develop this philosophy where where the products, like the decision making for the products um, is much easier because the philosophy right. you just is, put it you put it in your philosophy machine yeah. and it comes out the full product. Exactly. Okay. I like that. That's a cool idea, cool way to think about it. Um but mm. you know, of course, like on on a more foundational level, I'm always sketching. I'm always pushing myself in terms of my ideas. Um, I think like doing exercises, like you know, when I did uh, like the car this week, it was just like I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do like I'm gonna take a like a couple hours. And I'm just gonna do this. Yeah, and and that was a challenge to myself because. That that type of car, like a lot of the designs that I had been doing for the toys were very like much more geometric, I would say. Right. And this was trying to do something a bit more fluid. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was that was in itself a challenge and to and to take notes from the inspiration and take the essence of the inspiration and put it into the car, like, you know, that was a whole exercise in itself. Um but yeah, again it was it was deeper than just hard skills themselves it was like i don't know it was it was an exercise and also kind of understanding somebody else's philosophy i don't know yeah no i like i like your idea about the philosophy like machine that's interesting yeah but uh thanks for sending that in Nurawit. um that was a great question and then our next question comes from oguzan and I apologize because I'm pretty sure I might have messed oh, up with those like names. I feel like we butcher so many names on this podcast. <laughs> um, and they ask, when you guys get a job, do you take the company's values into consideration to see if they match your own values? Ooh. Which is an interesting topic. I think Aguzan is kind of touching on the fact of like, you know, maybe it's an ethical thing. Maybe there's sustainability you know, issues. Do you go work for a company that just you know, just makes a bunch of plastic crap or you do you go for some nonprofit company and he, he's asking kind of what, what, what should he do? I think they're, or they are in school. Right. Yeah. That's interesting because now, now that I think about that and I think about the answer to my last question, I think about how, how do, how does your philosophy then fit into the company's philosophy or goals? It is interesting because when you put, you know, I think about like bigger companies like Apple or Microsoft who have an established design. Well, right. I don't know about Microsoft, but Apple <laughs> has, has a very established design language. And if you come into that environment having your own philosophy and wanting to incorporate that into the design, how does that play out? Right. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. And that's 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 another piece of the puzzle that that I like that I'm working on figuring out. But it, it does vary for sure. Yeah. I think Apple would be more stringent on that. Whereas maybe, you know, a smaller company that doesn't have a really strong design language could, you know, really take on anything. Right. Right. Um, I, so far in my career, I haven't had a moment where I'm that concerned. I mean, yeah, I, I don't think that I've ever hit a point where, I'm considering working with somebody and there are ethical dilemmas there, along with that. Yeah, I think we I think uh Oguzan also mentioned the one question we answered on the Square One live mm. live podcast where oh, someone asked yeah. about you know, would you design a grenade or some sort of really extreme ethical decision or design. Right. Um you know, I think when it gets to that extreme level, you can certainly make a decision. Yeah. But if you're thinking about like sustainability and more, um, you know, bottom or like, I don't know, nit- nitty gritty kind of value things, honestly, in this in this uh, career, it's very competitive. So if you can get a job and the company doesn't exactly match all your values, like, in my opinion, you should take it. Like, I don't think you need to hold out for the the dream company because guess what? 
that's not that's not coming right out of school. Yeah, you got to work your way up there. Yeah, right out of school. Unfortunately, like you, if you haven't proved yourself to the degree of uh, somebody who gets hired by Kanye West, <laughs> um, you uh, sometimes you you have to kind of I don't want to say settle, but you have to. I think settles you the have word. To, you have to take you have to take a job that's given to you in order to start to build up a network. Yeah, and and you know some of some of your ideas about sort of the ethical implications of things can like evolve in that process and yeah. change during that process. And I I think the, there's a key thing to understand that I don't think students get is that you are a designer who's going to go work for a company and the company runs because they make money. Right. And that means that money is involved and that means that they need to sell things, which, you know, can go down the route of the other last week's topic of <laughs> why should we even be designers anymore? <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think you got to accept the fact that, Hey, you're going to be making products that may or may not align perfectly with your values and if you can if you can be flexible then eventually hopefully you can reach that level where yeah. you can actually work for a company or build a company that establishes those values that you believe in right and actually it so it's interesting because we got we got a response um, we were we were kind of asking the question about management at companies like moving up through a company oh yeah yeah and um, we got a response oh gosh I'm I'm blanking on the person's name. I think my Gmail is open. Um, I feel like the guy's name is Alex. Um, but uh, he actually told us, because uh, we were thinking that the only way that you can move up through a company is through management. Right. So you can be like a, a senior level designer and then eventually like a creative director and then a VP of design. And yeah. Then- and, and the higher up you go, the less design work you actually do. Right. But I, what this person was saying, yeah. If we can figure out his name, oh, but gosh. it's fine. I I know it's I know it's there. I think it's higher up. <laughs> <laughs> Bear with us for a second. I, I think it's Ricky. Ricky. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, Rick, oh yeah, R- Ricky. What's his last name? Ricky Biddle. Ricky Biddle. So he works, I think he works at Whirlpool. Um, and he was saying that at, at Whirlpool, there's this position and, and you're closer to the email. So you might be able to find it. Yeah. It's something like he, master, does master yeah, design. R- Ricky touches on the fact that, uh, there's this great program where you can either move up the management route or the mastery route. And essentially, if you move up the mastery, you just become kind of this senior level designer. And of course, you still get pay bumps every year. But you kind of, in in my head, it's you kind of become this more, I don't know, f- more of a like a principal designer, or like f- philosophical designer, like mm-hmm. where you kind of have, where, where, you know, maybe at Whirlpool, you're like a they need a new microwave so they give it to you and like you kind of create the vision for the microwave Mm -hmm. and you can really focus on that yeah whereas the management route is a lot more like yeah managing yeah i think it's um i think it's it's an avenue through which designers can continue to design right um whereas traditionally it's it's sort of it's sort of been or in more traditional business paths it's always from you know the person executing to the, to the manager right uh deliberating but um so you know in that way i feel like if you enter into a company and you rise through the ranks sort of traditionally like you can have a real effect on how the product is done for sure yeah you can go into one of these companies that does a lot more uh or maybe they don't have as much sustainability and if you rise up in that company yeah you can start implementing some of those changes yeah you know? and even even in some companies i will say looking back on my first job experience i had a lot of impact over the final design mm-hmm. even as a junior designer and like we kind of touched on this in the last episode when you right. were talking about your cat toy but i feel like there's always avenues in which you can, you know, um, 
bring in some of those, some of your personal ethics into the work. For sure. For sure. Um, and uh, hopefully be able to sleep at night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, yeah, that was a great question. Thanks for sending in a Guzon. Um, and then every week, of course, we like to give a shout out. We actually forgot last week, so Ugh. sorry, guys. But our shout out this week goes to Pat Kim, and his Instagram handle is at Pat Kim. Pat Kim. It's pretty simple. P A T K I M. Yeah. And uh, he's an interesting designer. He he uh, does woodworking and he designs these beautiful wooden objects. Yes, I'm pretty sure he went to school at Pratt. Okay. But I'm, but I'm not sure if he did industrial design or he did some sort of other design route but yeah he um he's got some really excellent work a lot of really beautiful lathed yeah he does well it's turned 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 yeah is that is that the correct term lathe is not a term but turned on the lathe yes but uh i won't we won't nitpick uh he yeah he does a lot of turned objects on the lathe and they're very they're very beautiful they're very like spherical and hemispherical and the one thing I'm thinking of is his stool that he did, which has, it's a, it's a stool, simple stool, has three legs, but each leg is a little different. Yeah. Like one leg has, it's like a wooden dowel, but it has little pegs coming out of it. So it looks like hairy leg. Yeah. It's really funny. There's a great sense of humor to a lot of his work, but also just like really beautiful craftsmanship. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the one who, who first made me aware of the Oloid. Uh, mm, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Oloid, it's a b- beautiful shape. Yeah, there's all sorts of... They just discovered some new geometry as well. I don't... I'll have to look this up because okay. this should have been design news. Well, we'll talk about it next week. I, I do know what you're talking about, but I think it's a new shape that they found in the body. I don't think it's actually a new shape in the universe. Oh. But we can talk about but, it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the Oloid, if you haven't seen it, it's amazing. It's like two... It's two intersecting circles. Mm-hmm. I tried to do an Oloid cat toy. It got oh, shot down. Oh, no. Although, maybe maybe it's still alive. I don't know. Yeah. But it's amazing because these two intersecting circles, so, like, the intersection, like, the end of each intersection happens at the the center point of the other circle, yes. and they're perpendicular to yeah. one another, mm-hmm. but they roll perfectly like a ball. Right. Um and yeah, Pat Kim, Pat Kim has some nice like brass alloys. Visually, it just looks really cool. Yeah, it's really nice. But so uh, check them out. Yeah, check them out. Doing doing sweet stuff. Um, and thanks for tuning in, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, our music is by Kiyoshi the Kid. And uh, yeah, you you guys have to check us out. YouTube. Mm-hmm. You got that video. Yeah. Um, like and subscribe. Subscribe. Yeah, of course. And smash that like button. Smash it. Smash it. Um, and of course we're on Apple podcasts and Google play subscribe right there. Um, and yeah, thanks guys. Thanks a lot. My, uh, you can check me out at Nick P Baker and I'm at I draw on receipts. All right. Peace out later.